For our third speaker, we have the pastor of St. Mary's and the president of the Center for Evangelical Catholicism, Father J. Scott Newman. And while I personally cannot actually imagine Father Newman ever having been a child, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, um, to say, it, In theory, he was born on August 6, 1962, in Elkin, North Carolina, to a family of Southern Baptists and Brethren. He grew up in Piedmont Triad of North Carolina and graduated from Regsdale High School in Jamestown, North Carolina in 1980. That fall, he matriculated at Princeton University and there on the 15th of October, 1981, after five years of atheism, he was converted to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was baptized in the Episcopal Church on 17th of January, 1982, and received into full communion with the Catholic Church in the, on the 5th of November, also 1982. After studies at Princeton and the Catholic University of America, he graduated with an undergraduate degree in philosophy from Belmont Abbey College near Charlotte, North Carolina. Father Newman studied for five years at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and received priestly formation at the Pontifical North American College. He was ordained to the diaconate on the 19th of December, 1992 at St. Peter's Basilica and to the priesthood on the 10th of July, 1993 at the Cathedral of John the Baptist in Charleston. He holds degrees in sacred theology and canon law. Father Newman began his service as the 16th pastor of St. Mary's on the 28th of June, 2001. And just before coming to Greenville, he served as the Dean of Men and Assistant Professor of Canon Law at the Pontifical College Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio. And prior to teaching at the Josephinum, Father Newman had previously served as Catholic Chaplain to the Citadel, as pastor of three other parishes in the Diocese of Charleston, including St. Mark's Newberry, St. Boniface Joanna, and Divine Redeemer in Hanahan. And he also taught at the University of the Virgin Islands, Thomas More College, and the Citadel. Father Newman presently serves as the Dean of the Piedmont Deanery of the Diocese of Charleston, as a member of the Diocesan College of Consultors, the Presbyteral Council, and the Priest Personnel Committee, and he previously served for seven years as the Diocesan Director of Continuing Education for Priests, and as a member of the Diocesan Vocations Board, Father Newman is a member of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem and the Knights of Columbus, the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars, the Canon Law Society of America, and the Society for Catholic Liturgy. He speaks regularly at conferences and retreats and is active in ecumenical affairs. And I personally think the best Catholic speaker in America, but I work for him, so I have to say that. So, all right. <laughs> My mother has asked me about 14 times whether this would be recorded today because she couldn't be here and the line about being unable to imagine my childhood will please her greatly. <laughs> we read in chapter 18 of St. John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus says, for this I was born and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And then Pontius Pilate responds, revealing himself to be the first postmodern man on earth. <laughs> what is truth? Father Longenecker and Father Smith spoke about their journeys from Protestantism into Catholicism. My own journey, though it began with Protestant families, was really a journey from unbelief to belief. And I think 
the challenge of today's university students and those a bit older and those who will follow is yet a different challenge because they're not certain what they believe about anything. It's the absence of conviction that makes it all but impossible to, as the Lord himself says, hear his voice. Bishop Robert Barron has written and spoken with great precision about the existential situation of what pollsters call the nuns, not N-U-N-S, N-O, N-E-S, those with no religion. They are not atheists. They don't have sufficient condition even to say God does not exist. They're simply rudderless, convictionless. They live in a world of social media, instant reaction, increasing isolation from each other, the hookup culture that dominated university life a generation ago has been replaced by the Me Too moment. They dare not touch each other or even look at each other for fear of being denounced. Isolation, atomization is the result that leaves them adrift. So the challenge for the church in proclaiming the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, at least in the West and at this moment, is to find a way to help them hear the word of truth. And it's useful, I think, for us to review briefly how Western culture came to this moment in order to understand how we might reply to it. The the great beginning of modernity, we might say, is the philosophical turn to the subject, which is personified in the work of the French philosopher René Descartes. Until that moment, when from the beginning of Western thinking and writing with the pre-Socratic philosophers of Greece, until the early modern period, Human thinking was preoccupied with looking at the world outside of ourselves, thinking about reality, about real things, whether they were the stars in the heavens or all the things that fill the earth, or even about our own bodies. We were thinking about other things than our own minds. But the modern project begins when thinking about things is replaced with thinking about thinking. How do I know what I know? Metaphysics is replaced with epistemology. And from there, we begin on the path, taking 400 years at least, to bring us to this modern moment where skepticism a profound doubt about my own ability to know anything because the senses can be so easily deceived because there are so many forms of lies in the world. Skepticism, we know now with absolute clarity from history, leads to relativism. The paradoxical claim that the only absolute truth is that there are no absolute truths. That, in time, gives birth to cynicism, a incapacity to treat anything or anyone with reverence, with real devotion. The idea of the sacred, of someone, something, or some place set apart for a holy purpose is withered away by cynicism. And finally, skepticism, relativism, and cynicism lead to solipsism, the turn onto the inside, the preoccupation of the self. You may remember the 
television commercials from 25 years ago of the woman who said, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. It was for a medical alert device, a call for help. Well, the postmodern man has fallen into his own head and can't get out. <laughs> We're trapped in this funhouse arrangement of mirrors where we see not anything outside of ourselves, but a reflection of a reflection of a reflection of a reflection of my own self. So if we're to teach the word of truth and awaken saving faith, the question is, how do you get to such a mind trapped in itself? I think a good place to begin is to recognize no matter what ideological constructions we embrace, human nature will always out. We can talk ourselves into believing many foolish things, but in the end, human nature reasserts itself. Think, for example, of the vast apparatus of tyranny erected by communism in the 20th century. It appeared to be absolutely impenetrable. The CIA and British intelligence were absolutely convinced that the Soviet empire would endure for decades, centuries. It seemed impossible to consider a way to crack that impenetrable separation of communism and the free West. But we know that it dissolved quickly, and God be praised, bloodlessly, mostly, because it was an illusion based on a lie. And human nature reasserted itself in a way that freed hundreds of millions of people from the tyranny of a lie. Right now, to create an analogy, we're confronted with many lies. Think, for example, of Bruce Jenner. In my youth, he was the platonic form of the male athlete, the world's greatest athlete. And now he stands before us, transmogrified into the female form by mutilation and chemicals, and proclaims himself to be not Bruce, but Caitlin. And we are instructed that we must call him she and acknowledge that he is a woman, a trans woman, but a woman. Friends, this is madness. It's a lie. And yet, it is saluted, celebrated by the high culture and the popular culture alike. And those who will not agree to the lie, those who continue, for example, even to insist on the use of the masculine pronoun in reference to the tortured soul of Bruce Jenner are reprobate. And in due course, this madness will lead to legal jeopardy for people who insist that gender is a grammatical concept and sex is a biological one, and there are only two. I cite that because it's the most provocative example, but you can multiply the many forms of cultural lies we are ensnared by. Now, how does human nature reassert itself? Well, no one has to teach us that we should be hungry when we haven't eaten after some time. Our hunger reasserts itself whether we want it to or not. Ask anyone who's ever tried to lose weight. Our human nature reasserts itself. No one has to tell us that we should feel tired when we haven't slept in many hours. No one has to tell us that we need a bath when we stink in our own sweat. Human nature demands that we eat and sleep and bathe, otherwise we pay the costs quickly. Well, in like manner, no one has to tell us that we should want to be happy. It's part of our nature. Raise your hand if you volunteer to be unhappy. <laughs> In a like manner, 
No parent gazes into the crib of their child and says, my beautiful son, I hope that you will be evil. <laughs> we, we naturally want to be happy. And we naturally understand that good and evil are not cultural constructs. They're things we didn't create or invent. We discover them. And goodness is better. We naturally want our children to be healthy, not sick. We naturally want them to be beautiful, not badly formed. Nature reasserts itself in all of these simple, ordinary human ways. And grace builds on nature. What is truth? Pontius Pilate asked. Was he asking in curiosity? Maybe. We know that his conscience was troubled by his wife, who by some means, Scripture does not tell us, knew in her heart that this man from Galilee was more than a man. Did he ask in a mocking tone of voice? or with sadness. One of the limitations of Holy Scripture, and we must assume a deliberate one, is that we never learn about things like tone of voice. When Peter said, you are the Christ, how did he say it? As a whisper. Or as a shout. Was he trembling? Or was he Weeping? We don't know. We know only that Pilate was puzzled. And so are our contemporaries. What is truth? They may ask from skepticism or relativism or cynicism or solipsism, but they're lost in their own heads. And they don't know what they don't know. So, I want to suggest that one of the hooks we can use to proclaim the gospel to people in this condition is their own misery, their own sadness, their own world weariness. There's nothing more pitiful than a healthy 21-year-old who needs chemicals just to get through the day because life is such a grinding burden. Suicide is the leading cause of death among the young, young adults especially. Death by despair, whether that be drug abuse, alcohol addiction, or suicide. We're the wealthiest civilization in human history, but we don't have a reason to live until and unless we hear the truth from the voice of God. In chapter 8, Jesus says to those who are trying to sort out who he is, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you continue in my word, the word continue can also be translated abide, as in live. If you live, if you dwell in my word. What word? The word of truth. If, it's a condition. If, then, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. The word simply means student. You are my students. And you will know the truth. What truth? The truth that makes you free. John tells us that those who heard the Savior say these words immediately object by reminding him that they are children of Abraham. And they conclude by saying, we've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean it will make you free? And the answer, of course, is, 
that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And it's the cruelest slavery of all. If I've been shackled to the wall by someone who overpowered me and made me a slave, I know that I'm a slave and I know who my enemy is. But if I'm a slave to my own sins, like those who heard the Savior, then I may not even acknowledge that I am a slave because I refuse to say that my sins are sins and I don't know my jailer because I'm the jailer. So what do we do? Well, we know this. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, says the Lord. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of the living God. He is the eternal and omnipotent word of the Father, who in the fullness of time took flesh of the Virgin Mary and was made man. The eternal word and the incarnate word reveals himself finally to the human race in the written word of Holy Scripture. Proclaiming the word of truth, the one who is truth itself, is our mission. And when someone cannot hear that word because of all the problems we've identified, then we have to ask, what's the path to this person? And that's why I say one possible hook is to use their own unhappiness as the portal. If we by nature want to be happy, just as if by nature we know when we're tired and hungry, then someone who says, let me show you a more excellent way. Do you want to be happy? Let me show you the truth that will make you happy, the truth that will cast light in your life, the truth that will set you free from your doubts and from your disordered self-love, then we might get a hearing. But we have to do this in a way corresponding to the background and the interests of the person to whom we're speaking. Some evangelists think that if you stand on the street corner and hand out tracts, you've done enough. Press the little booklet into their hand as they walk by, and the strangers will hear the word of God. Well, maybe. I got one of those put into my hand yesterday at Greenville Memorial Hospital. Um, I was dressed, of course, in my clerical garb, getting on an elevator, and... <laughs> this very kind woman said, do you know the Lord Jesus? <laughs> it's true. As she handed me the little book of scripture verses, I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I work for him. <laughs> as TJ said, I taught at the Citadel. I was... I was a chap Catholic chaplain of the Citadel, and they invited me to teach a uh, philosophy course. And so, uh, in the, in the, during the semester uh, on medieval thought, I talked a good bit about Augustine, not as a theologian, uh, but as a, as a philosopher, uh, particularly uh, his idea of the two cities, the city of God and the city of man, how that shaped the Western political tradition. But in the lecture where I introduced his biography to tell the students who this man was, I talked about his uh, time as a Manichae and his conversion in Milan and his eventual uh, ordination as Bishop of Hippo. And when I finished, I asked if there were any questions. And one of the cadets, uh, who was a very eager young Baptist boy, said, yes, I have a question, yes. Was he saved? You see what blinders do to us. Everything that I said about Augustine still failed to answer the question he had been taught was the existential heart of the world. Well, yes, he was saved. Well, when we approach those who don't know the Lord, even those who have been baptized and don't know the Lord, the question is, how do we speak to them? According to their background, according to the world as they see it, 
not to conform to their expectations, but to get a hearing. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. One of the things that people naturally want is to know the truth, to speak the truth, to live the truth, to love the truth. We don't have to convince people that that is better than living a lie. We simply don't. What we have to help them understand is what the truth is. What is the truth? And that's where speaking about the Lord Jesus in scriptural language, yes, in the language of the liturgy, uh, is an essential part of helping them understand why they exist and how they should live to be happy. I became an atheist as a middle school boy. The summer before the ninth grade, there was a summer camp for academics. Yeah, we went tubing and played basketball, and I think maybe rode a horse or two, but the morning was given to study. And it was up in the mountains of Western North Carolina uh, at a camp owned by Appalachian State University. Just a stone's throw, ironically, from a little part of that section of North Carolina called the Valley of the Cross, Valley Crucis, or as they pronounce it locally, Valley Crucis, which was organized by a group of Anglican religious, a community of priests formed in the Church of England after the Oxford Movement, and they were brought to North Carolina by the Episcopal Bishop of North Carolina, who sometime later, with his wife, went to Rome and knelt at the feet of Pius IX to become Catholics. So the little mission in the Valley of the Cross was finally abandoned because all the God-fearing Episcopalians learned from what the bishop did that it was all crypto-papism and they didn't want anything to do with it. But there's the little community still named Valley of the Cross. And in this camp, on a Monday morning, the first speaker was a professor of philosophy. She taught at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and her specialty was the philosophy of religion. And her purpose that morning was to explain to us why she could be a professor of the philosophy of religion and an atheist at the same time. And as she spoke, what she was saying helped me bring into a coherent whole intuitions that I'd been having since I was a little child. And I remember very distinctly, it was about 11.15 in the morning, and as she was talking and these things were forming, suddenly it was as though the tumblers of a lock fell into place. And in an instant, it was, of course there's no God. Of course there's no God. All religion is the survival of the childhood of the human race when we needed to invoke the gods to explain thunder and the moon and the stars. And now we don't need that. Now we know. Of course there's no God. That led to the formation of my mind into what I would describe as scientific materialism. That is the the view that the only true knowledge is obtained through the scientific method and that all of reality can be explained by observation. In other words, that the natural world is the only world. There is nothing beyond nature. There is no super nature. There's just nature. And the mind of man is capable of growing in knowledge of nature and through knowledge of nature, command of nature. And that this is the path of true wisdom. And that religion is just superstitious bunkum. So I was unlike most of the contemporary nuns in that I did have a conviction. There is no God and religion is falsehood. Or at best, superstition. 
It was for these reasons that I decided to go north to college rather than to stay in the south where all of my friends were going. I hedged my bets until the last minute. My best friend was going to Duke. Everybody else I knew, including my girlfriend, was going to Chapel Hill. I had a room reserved on both campuses. <laughs> And then I thought, no, I've got to escape the Christ on itself. And I went expecting to find uh, untrammeled reason, the bright light of truth understood by the rational mind, guiding an entire community of scholars and students, seeking knowledge of the truth and mastery of nature. And what I found, of course, was the modern university. Moral poverty, stultifying conformity, uh, ignorance uh, masked by political posturing. It was very discouraging. Well, even though I was going to be a science major, I had to take a liberal arts course that would fulfill the requirements of the university. And most people were taking literature or composition courses. I found a course, though, that I thought, yes, this is, this is exactly what I need. The course was entitled Christianity and its Critics. My purpose in enrolling was to arm myself to do battle. In high school, I'd been the village atheist, right? I delighted in provoking arguments and making the girls cry. <laughs> <laughs> In the ninth grade, I actually ripped a Bible in half. Another, another boy in my class had come up with a little Gideon New Testament and put it on my desk. His name was Oben Johnson. I said, Oben, please take that away. He said, no, this is my gift. I said, Oben, I don't want this. He said, I know, but one day you might find it useful. Please accept this. I said, Oben, if you don't take this away, I'm going to tear it up and throw it away. And he said, I have given it to you. What you do with it is up to you. So I stood up. I opened the little green Gideon New Testament, ripped it down the half on the spine, walked over and dropped it in the garbage can with great dramatic effect, provoking the uh, expected response from my classmates. At which point my teacher walked into the room realized what I had done, and hot tears began to stream down her cheeks. She reached into the trash can and she got both halves of the little Bible and took them to her desk and quietly put them in the drawer, never said a word, and then went on to teach. Years later, a few weeks before I left for Rome, I was passing by the school. It was summertime, but I saw cars outside the school and felt nostalgic, and I thought, I'll go in and see who's there. And the principal who was in the school in my day was still the principal, Harold Trump, uh, Crump. And I walked in, and I said, Mr. Crump, I am, and he said, you're Scott Newman. I remember you. You're the Bible boy. <laughs> He said, hold on just a minute, and he rang the phone. He said, Kathy, you'll never guess who's standing in my office, Scott Newman. Yeah, we'll wait. <laughs> the teacher happened to be there that day. She came into the room holding that little Bible. It's 15 years later. She still had it in the desk where she put it the day I tore it up. And she said, I kept this for you. I thought you might need it one day. <laughs> the truth changes human lives in unexpected ways that we may or may not ever live to see, particularly the truth of Holy Scripture. This is one of the reasons why it is absolutely imperative for each and every one of the baptized to know Holy Scripture from personal prayer and study. It is not enough 
that priests and religious know the scripture. We must all know the scripture because ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. If we're to introduce others to the Lord Jesus and open their hearts and minds to the truth, we need to be able to speak of the scriptures. T.J. referred to the moment of my conversion in October of 1981. The course that I took, Christianity and its critics, prepared me for my conversion months later by obliging me to read for the first time in my life the work of serious Christians, Augustine and Aquinas in particular, but also Pascal. And it was the first time I had ever read in any serious way the work of Christian thinkers. It was very easy for a precocious boy in North Carolina to sneer at Christianity because all I'd ever ex been exposed to was preachers, well-meaning men who sold Buicks Monday to Friday and preached on Sunday. Well, here's Augustine. What do you do with Augustine? You wrestle with him and Aquinas. So I was having an intellectual transformation, a sort of grudging respect that these men are not simpletons. I was surrounded by Christians. I was discovered, uh, shocked to discover that Princeton um, was filled with Christians, serious Christians, Protestants and Catholics alike, who were prepared to defend their faith, to explain, to give an account of the hope that is in them, to uh, answer objections um, in a sophisticated way. Then, in the spring of the year, my freshman year, I was in the Princeton Chapel one day. To get to the library at Princeton, from my side of campus, you had to pass right in front of the main door of the Princeton Chapel, which is a masterpiece of collegiate Gothic architecture. And I got in the habit of going in there on my way to the library, just for a moment's peace. The day was so filled with people and noise. And I told myself, this is just to sit quietly for a moment before I go study. And usually I'd be alone in the building. And in a building that size, when there's no sound, what you hear is the sound of the silence. It roars, right? Particularly at twilight, when the light begins to fail and the hearing is more alert. And looking at the glass and the wood and the stone sitting there in the silence in the spring of 1981, I thought, I know you are not there. And in the instant of the thought, I was aware of the paradox. If he is not there, then to whom are you speaking? <laughs> I got up and ran for the door. But the point is, the numinous presence of God, not N-E-W-M-A-N, -E not that numinous, numinous, N-U-M-I-N-O-U-S, the mysterious, uh, sacred gloom of that space awakened in me an awareness that there is something beyond nature, right? And that the scientific method, though crucial in our exploration of this universe, is not the only way of knowing. In fact, it's not even the most important way of knowing. In fact, it can't begin to approach the depths of the human heart. It's useful for exploring the cosmos, but not so much the interior landscape. The most important words we say, I love you. How can those be explained by the scientific method? This is why we have music and poetry and art. We don't live for iPads, the product of techne, of technological mastery over nature. We live for beauty, for love. So the course, the conversations with Christians, the attraction of this great unknown mystery suggested by that magnificent building. Then in the spring, after that, the girl at Chapel Hill, who'd been my high school sweetheart, decided that it was time for us to go separate ways. And it was devastating. I, well, it was devastating. I went back to school and decided I couldn't possibly 
go back home for the summer because all of our friends were the same small group. There was no way to avoid her. So I called an old family friend and said, I remember when you were in college, you worked the wheat harvest in Oklahoma and Kansas. Is the guy you worked for still in business? Well, yes. So I wound up going out to a custom combine crew for the summer to stay away from home. And when I got back home the first day, my roommate from school called to say that our next door neighbor had just died of a heart attack, 19 years old. Perfect health, a vigorous athletic young man, had a congenital heart defect that was unknown until he was dead. And that was the final piece. So the intellect, the heart, a yearning for beauty, and now death. What do you do with death? When great Aunt Bessie dies at 95, okay, fine. We're going to miss her, but we understand. But when a 19-year-old boy dies, well, that's earth-shattering. And the young man who died was an Anglican. So when we got back to school, though he'd had his funeral and burial in California, the Anglican chaplain organized us in the chapel, and there was, as referred to earlier, the Book of Common Prayer. And in the midst of it, a classmate, also a North Carolina boy, who from youth had learned the scriptures in many languages, began to talk to me about his faith, about the truth of the word of God. And he asked me if I would read with him Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Until that moment, I would probably have said no, but now the preparation has already taken place. All right, fine. It's like, you know, any course in the university, we're going to read a text together. So we begin to read Ephesians at dinner and to discuss it. And when we finished the text, we were at dinner that night, and we went back to my room to continue the conversation, and that's when he put the question to me. What do you think of what Paul has written? And the answer surprised me. I said, I would like to believe that this is the truth, but I don't know how. And then he said, would you pray with me? And I, I couldn't think of a convincing reason to say no. I hesitated, and he knelt on the floor and invited me to do the same. I doubt that kneeling on the floor would have been possible without all of those preparatory influences, intellectual and emotional, aesthetic. But I knelt and he began to pray out loud, first thanking God for his existence and for our existence, giving thanks and praise to the Father in the Son through the Spirit. And then he began to pray for the gift of faith for me. And in that moment, I entered fire. transforming, illuminating, purifying fire. And I don't know whether it lasted two seconds or two minutes or two hours, but I do know that when it was over and I came back to myself, I had an absolutely true intuition and knowledge of the truth of the gospel. And my first question was, where do I go to be baptized? And then immediately I was confronted with the divisions among Christians. Why aren't Anglicans Presbyterians? Why aren't Lutherans Baptists? And why is it the only thing they all agree to is that they aren't Catholics? <laughs> well, the Episcopal priest who conducted the service for my dead classmate was the only clergyman I knew. So I went to see him and explained what had happened. And I asked, what do I do about baptism? And he explained, you don't have to sort out 2,000 years of Christian messiness because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You can be baptized and then continue to sort out the question, where do you belong based on what you believe? So that's why I was baptized in the Episcopal Church, but already I was beginning to read and study and the usual path, the fathers of the church illuminating 
the true meaning of the scriptures, the medieval church, the development of doctrine, leading to the Reformation and the tragic consequences. And after having done that for several months, I called a friend one day and said, I have to become a Catholic. How do I do that? I've never met a priest. And he connected us, and I went through several months of private instruction and finally was received into the church that year. The witness of my friends, my peers, the availability of teachers who already knew the great tradition to talk about it, the beauty of that building and the nobility of the liturgy, each of these things in some way led to that moment of conversion and conviction. I believe that's how we approach the nuns. And if you think about it for more than a few minutes, you're going to find several of those in your life. Maybe a sibling, maybe your own children, nieces and nephews, the next door neighbor. I'll never forget when I was a boy, the old lady who lived next to us invited us to go to her Methodist church because she observed we didn't leave the house on Sunday morning. We actually went because she invited us. You never know what will happen when you issue the invitation. Always understanding that we are simply instruments trying to help others hear the voice of Christ and receive the truth. In the service of that project, and I close with this, there is no more powerful instrument than Holy Scripture. There's where the truth of the Word of God comes to the mind and heart of the hearer in such a way as to awaken a yearning for the truth of God, awaken a willingness to be changed by the truth of God, a desire to be conformed to the truth of the word of God. Because as we read in the letter to the Hebrews, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Thank you. Thank you, Father Newman. And we're going to quickly we'll probably only learn a few questions, but we'll get to a lot more during the round table. So the first question is, what can the laity do about the mess the church is in? We need instructions. One, two, three. There's nothing you can do about the mess of the clergy. Right? Uh, lots of people who are disgusted by corruption want to withhold contributions as a sign of their unhappiness. That doesn't hurt the clergy. We don't get paid enough to notice it in the first place. <laughs> but it hurts as the mission of the church. Right? So if you're disgusted with the clergy, don't close your checkbook to punish them. You're not punishing them. You're punishing those who are served by the church. Um, the lay faithful do not choose who their priests are going to be. The lay faithful do not choose which priests will become bishops, though they once did, and maybe they should again. The lay faithful do not decide who will be pope. So in the sense of what can you do other than pray, and you should pray, for the purification of the priesthood and the episcopate? Nothing directly. And I know that's deeply frustrating, but the corruption in the church, though it is reflected intensely and visibly in the lives of priests who are corrupt, the corruption in the church is everywhere. Is everywhere. So what you can do to promote the reformation of the church, that is the reformation, the recovery of the church's true form, which is the body of Christ, is to be zealous for holiness, for your own transformation. As Mother Teresa said, how can I change the church? By changing me. To be zealous for your own conversion and to give an example to those around you of 
deeper fidelity. In 2002, in the first explosion of the sex abuse crisis, Father Richard Newhouse wrote powerfully in the pages of First Things about what he called the Long Lent. And he said the, the answer to the Long Lent is not the changing of doctrine or the form of the church. The, the answer to the crisis that led to the Long Lent is three things. Fidelity, fidelity, and fidelity. That's what we do. All right, one last question. What is your opinion on Bishop Barron's view that we can have a hope that all will be saved? In fact, we're going to read at Mass this Sunday from uh, Paul to Timothy that God desires all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Uh, Christ, in the high priestly prayer at the Last Supper, uh, acknowledges in his prayer before the apostles that he will not lose any of what the Father has given to him. What has he given to, to Christ, the Father? The whole human race. It's this understanding that the mission of Christ is to redeem all of humanity because the Father desires that all be saved and come to knowledge of the truth is the foundation for the hope that in the end, no one will be damned for eternity. But a hope that all may be saved is not the same thing as teaching that all are saved. Apocostasis is the Eastern term for hell being empty. And there is a minority theological opinion in both the Eastern and the Western Church, that all will be saved. The best proponent of this in the West was a theologian named Origen, who in part because of that was excommunicated. Um, the Church does not teach, never has taught, and never will teach that all will be saved. But the Church does hold out the hope that all will be saved by coming to knowledge of the truth. Bishop Barron has drawn fire, um, particularly from traditionalist Catholics, who think that he has strayed too far toward the doctrine of universal salvation. I think that's an unfair appraisal of Barron's actual teaching. Barron is not the um, origin of this present construal of the hope that all may be saved. That was done by um, Hans Urs von Balthasar, a Swiss-German theologian of the 20th century who constructed a masterpiece of systematic theology, completely original in many, many ways. And, and Bishop Barron absorbed the ideas presented in this question uh, largely from von Balthasar. But I think the way Barron presents it conforms to what the church teaches authoritatively about the possibility of hell. You know, in any uh, debate between Protestants and Catholics on one of the disputed questions, for example, justification, how is man made righteous? In any debate between Protestants and Catholics, you almost always end up in a war of proof texting one verse of scripture against another verse of scripture. And almost always, the Protestant is quoting from Paul and the Catholic from Christ. Right. So you end up, the, uh, if you believe, uh, if you confess with your lips and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And the Catholic will respond, as I already said, not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only him who does the will of my Father. Which is it? Well, it's both. The point is, the Bible itself, and not a single book in the Bible, is a manual of systematic theology. We all want to build systems to weave all of these doctrines into a beautiful tapestry where each part is seen in the setting of all the other parts. But there's not one book in the Bible that does that. All of the texts of the Bible have their own background and purpose and they fit together beautifully, but it's the church who has to build that tapestry. And the habit of reading every book of the Bible in the context of all the others, every verse of the Bible in the context of all the others, is an expression of what is called 
the analogy of faith, that we understand every doctrine in the light of all the other doctrines. Heresy, which means in the original Greek, separation, is the reverse, to take one doctrine out of the context of all the others and hold it off by its own to make it the norming norm by which we understand all the others. It asks one doctrine, one verse, or one book of the Bible to bear a weight it's not designed to bear. And even though it may be a compelling version of what I intuit somehow must be the truth, heresy always leads to falsehood, not because the original doctrine was false, but because it sets it against all the other doctrines. So, I think Bishop Barron is not teaching falsehood. I think that he's reminding us of a legitimate part of the Western tradition, even if it makes missionary preaching harder. Because if there is no Philip fear of hell, as Father Smith discovered in his uh, childhood exploration of these questions, what motive have we to change our lives? You know, if we're all going to be saved, well, then eat, drink, and be merry. Waste your money on alcohol, women, and gambling. Because it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. Knowing the truth matters. And the hope that all may be saved is not in any way a diminution of the imperative to fulfill the Great Commission. All right, thank you. We're going to continue in 10 minutes. There's a fresh copy over on that side. Thank you.